Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for turning out on your lunch hour for the Analytical Answers Presents Mapping in Minutes webinar. As you've probably seen in the emails that you've received, this is the first in a two-part series, Demystifying SEM. And this is an interactive webinar. You're going to have plenty of time to ask questions. So definitely, if we don't cover something that you want to hear about, let us know and feel free to ask a question. My name is Christina Inge and I'm going to be moderating this webinar and Ed Norton is going to be leading the workshop and he's going to be sharing a live demo as well as an overview of some of the basics of SEM today. It's changed a lot over the last few years and you may be surprised at some of the new capabilities as well as the speed with which you can get results. So a couple of quick housekeeping tasks because, again, this is a very interactive webinar and we want you to be able to ask questions. There's a lot of people registered for this webinar, so we're going to keep everybody on mute and we ask that you look at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side and you'll see that there is a chat feature. Please use that chat feature to ask any questions or the questions feature. Um, I will be feeding those questions to Ed as the workshop progresses. We'll also have time at the end for questions. But again, please use the chat feature or the questions feature to type in your questions. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over the mic to Ed Norton. Ed is the technical director here at Analytical Answers with years of experience in microscopy for both um, industrial, pharmaceutical, and a wide range of other applications. Ed's going to be sharing his insights and answering your questions today, so welcome, Ed. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. I'm going to go through my presentation here. We're going to be talking about mapping in minutes and I'm going to assume that there's a basic understanding of scanning electron microscopy and how you can generate uh, elemental composition data from that, but I'll give a little bit of background for, for those that may not be terribly familiar, but I won't get a lot into it so that we have time for the uh, deeper follow through. So we're going to cover an overview. We're going to go over what is spectral imaging, which is allows us to do mapping in minutes. We'll talk about the tools we'll be using. I have a test sample in the instrument and some worked examples that I'll cover. It's a printed circuit board component. I'll be talking about sample navigation, which is part of what we call correlative optical and electron or scanning electron microscopy. And then we'll go into some of the details of how to process the data from a spectral image, including extracting spectra, principal component analysis, and line scans. So first of all, what is spectral imaging? Well, in the most basic form, elemental mapping will show you a color signal for how much of an element is present in a given pixel in the image. So here is a second uh, scanning electron microscope image, and the beam will raster across the surface of the field of view in order to excite each point in the sample to give off electrons that you can use to image and to give off x-rays you can use to do composition. Old style mapping or other analytical techniques that can't analyze a full spectrum at once will be limited to looking at just a single energy channel so that you don't get a full picture of what's present in each pixel. But spectral imaging collects a complete spectrum indicated here uh, showing examples of uh, a solder sample where we have a lead-rich and a tin-rich region so that you have a full spectrum in each pixel of the spectrum and that allows you to do more in-depth analyses. For instance, you can do corrections for peak overlaps and then you can also do full quantification, which is something that older systems or other types of analyses are not able to do. And this is all as a result of new innovations in software as well as hardware for the instrumentation. One of the benefits of doing spectral imaging is that the data set persists and can be examined further at any time for other features, even if the sample is no longer available. For instance, if you were doing a cross-section into a component and you ran a spectral image at a certain place in your cross-section, you may decide to cross-section further into that sample to get deeper in. However, you might notice a feature there and you wondered, hey, was that feature available in the earlier cross-section? With a spectral image, you could go back and re-look at the data set 
to see if that information were actually there. Just a note about the way the electron beam in interacts with the sample. The uh, electron beam is represented by this black arrow coming down on the surface of your sample. And the electrons which generate the images, the secondary electron or backscattered electron images, only come from the top fraction of a micron, sometimes even only a few nanometers, depending on the materials and your excitation energy. Uh, however, the X-ray data can come from quite deep into the material. So this simulation shows the spread of the X-ray generation if you had a 30 kilovolt beam hitting pure aluminum and the same 30 kilovolt beam hitting pure iron. So you can see that in addition to spreading out laterally quite a bit, it also goes to quite a large depth. Uh, and there's also quite a difference depending on the material that's being excited. So when you have these maps that you're looking at, this can lead to some blurring or mixing because of this bulk material that's getting mixed into the surface image that you see. Uh, in fact, some things that uh, might occur is you might detect a buried layer that you can't see from the surface at all, but because the X-ray beam is penetrate, or the e electron beam is exciting X-ray so deeply into the sample, then you are basically picking up something you can't even see. The instrumentation we're going to be using today, both for the live portion of the demo and the portion that was done ahead of time, is the Zeiss Evo LS15 and what we call the Advanced Scanning Electron Microscope. It's got a very high resolution, high intensity electron beam due to advances in column development as well as using a Lab 6 lanthanum hexaboride emitter. And then we're also using the Thermo NSS Spectral Imaging System. And this is a software package and a hardware component. And this is our EDS detector, Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. And this high sensitivity SDD detector has very, very high x-ray collection efficiency and a very large area. And this is what allows us to collect so many of the x-rays that we're generating by hitting the sample with our high intensity electron beam. So it's the increased x-ray generation and the efficient collection that allows the maps to be acquired so quickly, which is why we call this mapping in minutes as opposed to in days of your, we'll say, when mapping took much longer to accomplish. And then, of course, the software package behind it that goes along with the thermo detector is what allows you to do the post-processing to bring the most out of your data. So the sample we'll be looking at today is what you'd think would be a very simple component. It's this little silver canister which is attached to a printed circuit board. And this is just a printed circuit board that came out of a, a computer, like I'm sure many people have seen. Uh, nothing fancy or exciting on the outside. But when you do a cross-section and look at the inside of the component, there's actually quite a lot of different uh, sample types that you could be looking at here. There's weld connections in several locations between dissimilar materials. There's also a conductive epoxy holding a quartz crystal in place, because this is an uh, oscillator. And then there's also solder connections that lead that connect the, the leads of the component to the printed circuit board. And this is what we'll be covering different parts of as our worked examples today. Sample navigation is a, a feature we try and incorporate into every analysis on this instrument. And the reason for that is it gives you the ability to correlate optical microscope images, which are, of course, what people are used to seeing by eye with the electron images, which are not always uh, the same as what you'd expect when you're looking at a sample bias. So by correlating those, there's an extra dimension of information that you might not have had if you only had one or the other type of image. The sample navigation in the microscope also allows you to take this very picture here and load it into the microscope, and you can use that to navigate around the sample very quickly so it gives you a very easy workflow, and you can always be assured that you're looking at the exact portion of the sample that you would like to. Uh, you can use images from any source, uh, a camera or a microscope, which we of course have abundance of here. You could even use a smartphone if you really had to, but it's not what we prefer. 
since the SEM doesn't show you colors, it just shows you grayscales, sometimes uh, targeting a specific feature by color is important, and that's where this correlative optical and electron microscopy can be a real benefit, because something that's almost completely invisible in the SEM could still be navigated to accurately. And then at the end of an analysis, you can overlay images from the SEM onto the optical image, again, to, to verify the locations that you analyze and also compare differences uh, between the way they look in each mode of imaging. So I'm going to switch to the microscope for a moment. And I just want to show you an example of the sample navigation. No. Scratch that. <laughs> Apparently, uh, GoToWebMeeting does not uh, appreciate the, uh, the SEM software, so we'll just skip the, the live uh, portion from the SEM at the moment. We'll go back to the slides. So the process for acquiring spectral images is uh, pretty straightforward. The first thing you need to do is just capture a standard electron image, either secondary or backscatter, and that's shown in the top here on the left. And this is allows you to overlay the maps onto that image once you've acquired it and acquired the maps. And also the software and the SEM work together to make sure that there's no drift so that the pixels of data from the map are correctly aligned throughout the duration of an analysis. So it takes a reference photo at the beginning and then it compares that continuously throughout the analysis to make sure that the data registers properly. And that can be very handy for samples that are charging or maybe not stable under the excitation of the beam. The next step is to acquire map data, which uh, I've shown an example of a, I'll, I'll say calcium map, uh, on the uh, upper right. And I say calcium with quotes around it because that's not technically a correct map. That just shows you the raw counts coming off the detector. However, the data on the right-hand side of that image is actually from the tin in the solder joint that's seen in that image. And that's a, an overlap that, using non-spectral imaging, you might completely miss. And you would therefore have bad information. But because we have the entire spectrum to work with, we can do our post-processing, which corrects for peak overlaps and also background subtraction, and therefore gets rid of these peak overlap errors. And then we get the nice clean calcium map, which is shown on the lower left. And this can be converted into what's called a net counts, which is just a subtraction of any of the overlaps or any of the backgrounds, or you can then quantitate this to provide a weight percent map and actually look at distributions and gradients and, con and concentration once you've corrected for the sensitivities of each element. And then your output can be, uh, as seen in the lower uh, right, you can either overlay the maps individually onto the SEM image, you can output them with just a black background as seen on the lower left, and then you can do further things such as extract spectra or line scans from selected regions. And we're going to do all of this later, so don't worry. So the first example I'm going to work through, and this is just going to be uh, through slides, and then we'll do a little more advanced work on this exact same uh, part of the sample, is the lid seal. Now this has to be a hermetic seal because the components inside uh, need to uh, remain separate from the atmosphere in order to not degrade over time. And so what we have is in the red box is where the seal from the lid meets the base plate. And we want to understand a little bit more about the materials involved here. And again, this is another example of correlative optical microscopy where in the up top center, we have a low mag optical showing where the higher mag images were taken from. And then the lower left, we have a high mag optical image. And then in the lower right, we have a backscattered electron image from the SEM. And again, the, the three of them together make a very nice story about exactly what you can see uh, in the sample uh, using those visualization techniques. But now we want to look at what's going on with the chemistry. So we zoom in a little bit, and the map that gets acquired on the left is the backscattered image, and that's, again, used for drift compensation. 
And then on the right, we end up with the maps that uh, are acquired. And this can be done very quickly. That's why we call this mapping in minutes. And I will do that now to demonstrate for everybody. What? Oh, oh I guess you can see the, the SEM image now. That's handy. So all I'm going to do here is zoom in and focus and then select the region that we want to map over. So this is a backscattered electron image, and I'm going to focus right on this part of the weld joint here. And you can see, if you look at my optical image over on the right-hand side, that uh, there is a little crosshair which shows exactly where we are on this sample. And again, that's part of the image navigation and the correlative optical aspects. So now that we have the SEM set up for where we want to look on the sample, we go back to the NORAN software that interacts with the instrument, and we acquire the image. And again, this is the first step in the process that I talked about when I was introducing the, the overview of how we acquire this data. So this takes about 30 seconds, and it just scans the region that I've set up. It actually scans it at a lower magnification than I selected so that it has enough correction space in order to do that drift correction I mentioned. And as soon as this image finishes acquiring, we can begin the data acquisition. So the beam is scanning from top to bottom, and so all the different elemental maps start appearing almost instantly on the right-hand side. I've got it currently set to do 15 10-second frames, and that'll be our two-and-a-half-minute map. And this is literally mapping in minutes. Now, depending on the type of sample you have and what you're trying to extract in terms of data, you may actually need to run longer. But for the purposes of uh, our only short time together today, I'm going to keep it to a two-and-a-half-minute map. But you can see that we have quite a lot of data already in that we have, in just half of the time, uh, we have almost 40,000 peak counts in the spectrum shown in the bottom right. Uh, while the maps generate in the upper right. And as the spectrometer detects elements, it starts to identify them. Uh, it's up to the analyst to decide whether those are real or not real, because there are overlaps that need to be taken into account for. And while the spectrometer does a very good job of it, uh, thankfully for job security purposes, we can you know, step in and put a little more intelligence into the decision than a computer can sometimes through our experience. So the types of things we're seeing here in these maps, which I can make bigger at the uh, end of the analysis and when I overlay them, is we're seeing carbon on the upper left of the image, which is from the mounting epoxy that was holding the sample in place during the cross-sectioning. We see a very bright line of nickel at the bond interface and along the surfaces, and so it looks like there was a plating on those materials. We see that the bright material at the top of the image is a copper, zinc, and some nickel alloy. And then we can see that the bottom material is mostly iron, but again, it appears to have a nickel plating on it. So that seems like a cost-cutting feature. Instead of using a more expensive material, uh, a nickel-plated iron would give you adequate corrosion resistance because of the nickel, uh, but you wouldn't have to pay for something more expensive than just iron. So there's our 15 frames. And again, it took two and a half minutes. Hopefully no one found that amount of time unbearable. And so this is just our straight counts map, which I mentioned before. 
And so we can overlay each of these onto the main image. And one thing to take note of is that, for instance, the phosphorus signal, which is very weak, if I zoom in the spectrum down here, you can see that it's, first of all, superimposed on a fairly high background, which is just part of the nature of the spectrum that comes off of the sample. So we want to get rid of that background to really understand where the phosphorus is. So now in this case, we're going to process this to correct for those overlaps in background that I mentioned before and convert this into weight percent. And this goes very, very quickly because of the advances in computing power as well as the algorithms built into the processing software. And so now, as we process these maps, we get a much clearer picture of what elements are where, in particular those elements that might have been affected by background or overlap. So for instance, the phosphorus now, we could see was very much concentrated in just a few domains, mostly at the outside edge outside of the weld region, but then in just a few domains within the weld region itself. As before, we can still see that the top material is a copper, zinc, and some nickel alloy, but the bottom is completely absent of those elements and just has iron. Something else we can do if we want to understand a little bit more about these regions is we can start to extract spectra. So this is uh, my slide demonstrating what we just went through with the processing, and then we're going to cover extracted spectrum. So what we can do is in any region we wish, we can come in and draw a box or a regular shape, and all the pixels that are in that region get added together, their spectrum, to produce a high quality, very high signal to noise spectrum and that allows us to see a little more clearly what's in that region. And this is the type of post-work investigation that you can do once you have this data set. So we can also come down here and look at the iron and see that we don't see any things like chrome and the nickel is down at the noise level, so it's not a, it's not a stainless steel. And then we can even come out here to the place where the nickel is present. And we can see that there's an iron-nickel uh, mixture here. And so it looks like the nickel plating was actually diffusing into the iron substrate. And whether this was done before or during the weld is a little difficult to tell just by looking at this area because this region also experienced some heat most likely. But if we come right to the very edge, we see a phosphorus peak. And so this, Im this indicates that we had a nickel phosphorus or electroless nickel plating, and the phosphorus all stayed right at the outside edge, and it was the nickel that diffused into and mixed in with the iron. And if we go and look at some of these other small areas that showed up as phosphorus rich, when we did the map, we can again see that the phosphorus signal is quite high there relative to what it is in some of these other areas. So it's very easy to come through and explore the data after the fact to try and get a better understanding of what you learned. And again, the nice thing about this is that you can still do it even if the sample is no longer in your possession, either because it was destroyed through further cross-sectioning or if uh, because you uh, sent it back to the client, for instance. If we uh, go to my next slide, this is just another example of looking at that nickel phosphorus uh, domain versus the nickel iron diffusion region. And now we're going to look at a, another example. And this is of the conductive epoxy. And so what we have here is, again, this is some optical images with some SEM images, part of correlative optical microscopy. And here we see a metal alloy, which is the mount for this component. We see what we suspect to be and will prove to be the quartz crystal, and it's held in place with what appears to be a standard silver-filled epoxy. So this one I'll just work through in slides now that everybody has seen 
how the process goes and how quickly it can go, how much information we can get uh, just in a couple minutes worth of mapping. So once this map was completed, we could see all the different elements, of course, that were present. So we come back to the software. We can now process the maps as we did the other ones. And see what we have. So again, we're going to go to weight percent. So although this bottom metal piece is a different piece entirely from the lid, it appears to have a very similar composition in that it has uh, zinc, copper, and nickel. As, uh, as I mentioned, it looks like it has a, a very standard silver-filled epoxy as the bulk of that material. And, of course, the crystal is going to have silicon and oxygen. Actually, I didn't let the spectrometer include the silicon, so we'll reprocess that with that in there. And again, this map was also acquired in the same two and a half minutes that all the other maps were. What I found most interesting about this, of course we have the, some carbon deposits in the epoxy where you have a little more epoxy than sil uh, silver because it's not uniformly dispersed. Uh, again, we have the base alloy, which is the copper, nickel, zinc. But the most interesting thing I found here was the presence of a layer of sulfur right along the interface between the epoxy and the uh, cradle that was holding the quartz. So silver, of course, reacts quite readily with sulfur. And if this corrosion were to continue, it's entirely possible that this could lead to either a mechanical or electrical uh, compromise to the part. And even though the spectrometer says that there's sulfur there, maybe we don't always believe the spectrometer. So what we want to do is use the freehand extraction tool and we're gonna double check so I'm just gonna draw a little box and it's going to extract a spectrum right around the sulfur where it appeared in the map and then it's gonna show me the spectrum from that region and here we can very clearly see a sulfur peak which we could not see when we were looking at the full uh, spectrum of the entire area because its contribution to the whole spectrum is fairly small because it's only in a very small area. So now that uh, we have this sulfur here, uh, one, one issue when you find sulfur is that there are some overlaps that could be present. And so we're going to use what's called a synthetic spectrum to verify that the sulfur is really sulfur. So the green is the data we've extracted from that small region. And the red is what's called the synthetic spectrum or simulated spectrum. And the spectrometer has a library of all the elements. And so when you put together a certain combination, it can generate a synthetic spectrum that allows you to do these sorts of comparisons. So uh, I believe that this was sulfur but a very common overlap known to uh, analysts that do EDS is that moly and 
uh, lead are also possibilities in this case. So if I turn the sulfur off, we can see that the sulfur disappears. And so let's check to see if it's moly. Um, the moly has a second set of peaks that would give a distinct shoulder to a sulfur peak of this size. And so that's clearly not a good fit. Now, if you had only a very, very small sulfur peak, that might be difficult to see. But in a peak this size, it's very clear. And when we look at the lead, we can also see that even though the centroid of the peak is very similar, the simulated lead peak is too small and off to the side to actually account for the peak we've observed. So we can safely say that it is sulfur. And again, the statement that uh, silver sulfide might be a problem at that location in the sample is something that we can uh, think about when describing this failure analysis uh, to a customer. And this just illustrates that point a little bigger. And again, the orange represents the sulfur, and I did a freehand extraction. And of course, I picked up some surrounding materials because, uh, frankly, I can't draw very well. Uh, but we did get enough sulfur in the, in the spectrum to ver verify its existence. And again, this is uh, just a, a reminder of what we just did with the spectrum simulation. And some of these are duplicates because when we send these slides out to people after the fact, you're not going to have uh, necessarily access to uh, the live recording. And so the uh, slide here will help you remember uh, what we showed. So now what is component mapping? Uh, this is a, one of the more advanced uh, algorithms that the software can perform. And the picture here is pretty fantastic looking. It's not the same sample. Uh, but what the software does is it, it performs what's called principal component analysis. And this is where it analyzes the spectra from each and every pixel in the image, in the spectral image that you've acquired. And it looks for similarities and, and tries to find pixels that are related to one another by having similar compositions, similar mixes of elements. And once it finds these base components, it puts them back together to give you a map where each pixel in the map no longer has a particular uh, percent you know, of calcium. It's got a full spectrum that represents the sum of all those domains. And the fact that it can sum all those domains means that you can get much better spectra because it's binning more pixels than you can draw, for instance, with my little freehand to look at a particular region. Uh, these components, uh, again, are mapped to, get, to give you regions that have unique signatures. And uh, the components are displayed similar to our normal maps. If we go back to our previous example, which is our silver epoxy, we can run our phase analysis on this. And again, it's now examining every pixel to try and come up with these phases. And in this case, it came up with quite a, quite a few. <laughs> Uh, some, uh, there's filtering you can set in, but the one I really care about is phase five, because that's the one that seems to correspond to the sulfur, which is the element I was examining before. And here, the, the signal strength of that sulfur is much greater than it was during my freehand, because it's summing up the sulfur-containing pixels from all these regions along that entire interface. So it's including a lot more data and only the important data than what I could draw manually in any reasonable fashion due to my poor artistic skills. Just kidding. In any event, when we look at the phase map, uh, once it's been simplified a bit, we can see that phase one corresponds strictly to our base metal. Uh, phase two is the silver epoxy. Phase three is the quartz crystal itself. And again, phase four uh, in this uh, slide is what corresponded to the sulfur. And again, looking at it this way, it allows you to get a, a much better understanding because it can simplify the, your understanding of these different domains by grouping all these pixels together. So you can just see very quickly what's similar and what isn't.
And there are some subtle features that all of a sudden jump out at you, like this line of sulfur-containing material that might not have stood out as strongly in the normal maps. And then because it's combining so many more pixels together, you get much better spectra with higher signal-to-noise, which, if there was less sulfur there, would be important because you would be better able to see if it was really sulfur versus some other overlapped element like moly or lead using the spectrum simulation. And this is just a comparison of the two spectra on one screen. My hand-drawn extraction shown above and the component map shown on the bottom. And you can see that the size of the sulfur peak relative to the background is much more intense. And in this case, uh, we had enough sulfur even in the hand-drawn to positively identify it. But in lower concentrations, the component map certainly would have done a better job of bringing that information together. And this is going to be our last worked example where we have the solder joint down at the uh, bottom where the component is attached to the printed circuit board. So again, this is another one of our correlative sets where we see opticals and some images at uh, the same magnifications. Uh, again, the backscatter image shows you the composition differences in the sample. So dark things are low in atomic number. Bright things are very high in atomic number. Uh, this is a tin lead solder, so you'd expect it to be very bright. Uh, but things like the epoxy and the resin that make up the board are fairly dark. And so if we come to a little bit higher magnification, uh, we can see, again, the individual domains in the solder. And we can see... Uh, the uh, connection to the uh, copper plating on the board. So now I'm going to go back to the SEM and I'm going to use my image navigation to just double click on that optical image to get right to my region of interest very quickly. And uh, adjust the contrast for this particular region we're in, which is uh, very different from that seal that we were looking at up on the lid. And I'm sure most people who work with solders know that uh, many solders phase segregate into two different phases or more. Uh, in this case, we have a, a a lead-rich and a tin-rich phase. And I'm just going to zoom in to focus here. Uh, the thing that caught my eye here, which we're going to focus on in this last live example, is right at the interface between the copper plate and the solder. So now that I've got the sample set up in the SEM, we're going to go back to the EDS software, and we're going to acquire our image. Once again, we're taking 10-second frames, and that's how long it takes for the beam to travel down the field of view. And so you can see that same pattern in the data as it appears, very much like the other map we acquired. What we see, first of all, is that we've got a high concentration of carbon at the top, which is the uh, epoxy mounting the sample. Uh, the dark material on the left is actually the resin that makes up the printed circuit board. 
Uh, we also see the fibers from the fiberglass, which reinforce the board. And that's where the calcium, silicon, and oxygen are primarily located. And then, of course, we see the tin and the lead make up the solder. So we're a little over halfway done here on our very quick map. Oh, and of course we can see the copper making up the plating right in the middle. Once this is complete, we're going to do our standard processing into weight percent to correct for overlaps and background. And then I'm going to show you one last trick. So now we're processing into weight percent. And this, this sample was the same one I had showed for the calcium tin overlap. And again, the calcium is now corrected for, and we see very little of it in the tin phase. Most of it, of course, is in the fibers where it should be. Same thing with the silicon. And of course, we have oxygen in both the resin, the mounting epoxy, and in the fibers itself. Uh, the copper plating uh, is interesting. Uh, what I found my, most interesting about this is that you can pick up a very little thin layer of tin right along that copper lead, uh, tin lead solder interface. So there appears to be a very thin intermetallic that's forming in that location. And so what I want to do is extract a line scan from that region to see if that's really a tin copper intermetallic. So what I've done is I've drawn a line on the map and the distance is the distance over which it's going to present the data uh, but the width of the line is how much how many pixels it's going to average together so that you get much better data than if you were to do just a single row of pixels using very little data. So it's going to average over this entire width and present us with a plot showing the uh, composition in that location. So if we uh, plot the tin superimposed now on the map and also shown here on the right you can see that indeed there is a very high tin concentration right at the interface with the copper and of course the line extends into the tin rich phase on the right end of it. We also see that the lead doesn't have any heightened concentration at that interface uh, so it's it's not a lead rich phase that's forming reacting with the copper and if we overlay the copper We'll just change that color so you can see them better. So we can see that the copper and the tin completely overlay in this line scan here, uh, overlaid on the map, and also seen over here on the uh, right-hand side. So that very clearly demonstrates that you can pull another type of data out of, out of the already saved maps. Uh, in addition to extracted spectra and component maps, you can also do line scans. Uh, which, if you have a nice linear feature, is a very good way to, to demonstrate the types of things that are occurring when you have two dissimilar materials mixing.
So that's the last worked example I'll be going through. Uh, I just want to Okay, so uh, I'd just like to mention that we do have uh, several upcoming webinars. Only the first one has a firmly scheduled date, and that's next Tuesday. It's called Mapping the Nano. It's going to be performing more EDS analyses, but on much, much smaller domains to get rid of that blurring effect we mentioned that happens when you analyze bulk samples. And we'll be using the FIB to prepare thinned samples to analyze these smaller regions. Uh, the instrument we're working on today also has a thermo WDS, which is wavelength dispersive spectroscopy. It's a technique which has higher resolution than EDS and better sensitivity, so you can uh, correct for peak overlaps even better than using spectral simulation or any of the advanced software algorithms built into the software. Uh, the microscope we're using is also fully capable of looking at wet samples. And so you can put in dry samples and watch them get wet, or you can put in fully wet samples and watch them dry, or anything in between through the use of the introduction of water vapor and a cold stage. And then we'll also have a separate webinar that covers correlative optical and electron microscopy in greater detail beyond the snippets that were presented today. So I'd like to say thank you very much. We'll take questions at this time. Uh, if you don't have time to answer or ask any questions here, then you can uh, email us at the address on the screen. Uh, Christina will uh, moderate the questions at this time, if there are any. Okay. One question that came in was, do you have to uh, define elemental windows before starting the map? The answer is, uh, I think I, I covered that, the answer is no. Because you're getting an entire spectrum from each pixel in the map, you don't have to define anything ahead of time or after the fact that's locked in. You can always go back and change the elements you've mapped for, so that way you can dynamically change it as needed. You can add them part way through, you can subtract them if you find that they don't make sense because they shouldn't be there. Uh, but again, if you don't agree with the spectrometer, you can always check your work by extracting uh, spectra and verifying that any decisions the, that you came to uh, are actually accurate and correct. Okay, we have another question coming through. Is this method able to be used for polymer non-metallic materials? Uh, the answer is yes. You can, uh, you can certainly use this to look at polymeric materials. Uh, as with all SEM work on polymers, you typically have to coat the sample with a conductive coating. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will end up with uh, charging problems because the sample cannot dissipate the charge from the electron beam. Okay, that looks like pretty much we've got two questions. We do have about 10 more minutes left in the webinar, so if you have any more questions, please let us know. Um, as Ed mentioned, we have a couple of upcoming webinars coming down the pike, and we've got um, one coming up next lunchtime on May 3rd, which is going to be the advanced version, as Ed mentioned, this webinar. Everybody who has registered for this webinar is going to receive not only a recording of this webinar, so you can go back and refer to it, um, but you're also going to be automatically registered for the May 3rd webinar and watch your emails for the link to sign up and attend that one as well. So if you're excited to attend the next one and you want to find out more advanced um, information, uh, you can definitely uh, avail yourself of that next Tuesday, May 3rd. We have another question coming in. How deep into the sample does the beam penetrate? Yes, uh, that goes back to my slide. Um, let's see, right here. So the beam penetrates uh, up to tens of microns, depending on the density of the material you have and the energy of your beam. 
So the scale on here is 10 microns uh, in the lateral, but it's also in the vertical. So when you're hitting a low atomic number material like aluminum with a 30 kilovolt beam, while most of the information will come from the outermost few microns, you can still get some data from much deeper in. And so if you're looking for very sensitive detection, you can still pick up those very weak traces uh, when they're coming in at a distance. Uh, as you can see with the iron, it's much smaller because of the higher atomic number of that material, and so you do get a smaller analytical volume uh, with most of the information coming from the top one, two microns, but you can still get some data from as high as five microns, although that's not the highest uh, intensity of data from those fringes of those uh, blooms where the E-beam spreads out into the material. Okay, well that seems to be the last question. Um, again, please feel free if you didn't have a chance to ask any questions. Again, we're going to stay here for a couple more minutes. Um, if you didn't ask any questions this time but you still have them, feel free to email us at answers at analyticalanswersinc.com or if you have any um, more advanced questions or needs, feel free to reach out to us again, answers at analyticalanswersinc.com. This recording is going to be sent out to everybody, and feel free to also share information about our next webinar with any colleagues that you feel would be interested. Again, completely free, and we welcome your questions. Also, if you have a suggestion for a webinar, that we haven't yet offered or that wasn't on Ed's slide talking about what's coming up next, absolutely feel free to uh, request a particular kind of webinar. And if there's enough interest, um, then we will probably try to put something together for you. Again, our next upcoming lunchtime Lunch and Learn is going to be mapping the nano. That's going to be at the same time, 12 p.m. on next Tuesday, May 3rd, where we're going to talk about using FIB prepared samples to analyze smaller domains and thinner layers. And then all of these webinars are coming up. They will probably all be at lunchtime, and they generally will fall on a Tuesday. If a different time is more convenient to you, we definitely want to listen to you and uh, provide you with the most effective time for your learning or the most effective date. So feel free to reach out with that. There's also going to be a survey sent out to all attendees. So thank you again for attending the Fast Mapping webinar. Uh, again, Ed Morton shared a lot of really wonderful knowledge with all of us, so please stay tuned for next week's webinar, and thanks for attending.